on the African scene, the politics of succession in Africa, the crisis of stability and power. How, how critical is this? Police arrested for 12 people for the violence in Johannesburg, while eight others were arrested. Well, African countries are boiling over the fact that Africans in China are facing stigma and are battling discrimination in China over the coronavirus pandemic there. Well, why is this so? Is it time for a rethink uh, to, towards Africa-China relations? Uh, these are some of the issues that we will be dealing with on today's edition of The Agenda. My name is Henry Williams, and I'd like to welcome you to the show. Uh, do remember, you can watch us on the go. We log on to our website at www.loveworldplus.tv or download our app from any of the online stores. And that is Love World Plus. Well, let's get on the show as we kick off with this report that will set the pace for today's discussion, and we'll be right back. The clamor to make China pay is growing louder. The latest on the list is Nigeria. A group of Nigerian lawyers is suing China. They want $200 billion in damages. Reports cite a statement. The damages are being sought for the loss of lives, economic strangulation, trauma, hardship, social disorientation, mental torture and disruption of the normal daily existence of people in Nigeria. The lawyers have a two-phase action plan. First go to the Federal High Court of Nigeria and then persuade the government to sue China as the International Court of Justice. Africa's anger against China is being fueled by the racist attacks Africans are facing in China. They are battling discrimination and stigma. Social media is awash with videos. This one shows a Chinese police officer harassing an African man. Another video shows a group of Chinese men attacking an African, with a woman shouting out for help in the background. The exact context or what transpired before and after the video was shot is not clear. Racism and xenophobia are on the rise in China. Reports say thousands of African origin people have been left homeless after being evicted over fears that they could be spreading the coronavirus. This is apparently linked to a cluster of COVID-19 cases in the Nigerian community in the southern city of Guangzhou in China. The African students residing in the area say they have been subjected to arbitrary quarantines and forced evictions. Mohammed, a Guinean student in Guangzhou, narrates his ordeal. When you go out, people run away from you. It's very terrible. You will be like uncomfortable to stay in that country. So every time your family is calling you, asking you about the information, how you are living here, and then how you are struggling. But there is something you cannot tell them. Because they will feel bad, they will start crying and they're worrying about you. The African Union earlier this month expressed its extreme concern about the situation in Guangzhou and called on Beijing to take immediate corrective measures. Several African ambassadors in China have written to the country's foreign minister over the discrimination faced by Africans. But the hands of these governments are tied. Most of them have taken billions of dollars of Chinese loans. 
Nearly two decades of lending has made China Africa's top creditor. Between 2000 and 2017, China's government, banks and companies lent some $143 billion to Africa. The continent now faces multiple challenges, repaying China's loans, fighting China's virus and dealing with China's racism. The pushback has begun. The lawyers in Nigeria seem to be leading the way. Bureau Report, we own. World is one. All right, uh, that report, uh, courtesy of Gravitas, uh, gives us, you know, a picture of what we are talking about. Not quite a, quite a pleasant development. Another reason to wonder about the sleeping giant Africa, as African residents in the southern city of Guangzhou say they have suffered forced evictions, arbitrary quarantines, and mass coronavirus tests. Well, we've seen Nigeria lead the way in asking questions uh, to the um, Republic of China, especially its ambassador in Nigeria, a, a call to question, and he has spoken. We will get to that. But first, let me bring in my guest who joins me on the show today. I'd like to welcome Achike Chude, uh, uh, African Affairs Analyst and also an author. It's great to have you on the show, Achike. Always a pleasure. Hurry. Yeah, quite, not, or not quite a pleasant development, uh, you might say, Achike. What are your thoughts? Well, that was a good uh, report. I mean, uh, it's as a candid as uh, it, it could possibly be. Um, I mean, the, the reality is that uh, we cannot uh, wish China away in a hurry. China, over the years, has become a part and parcel of our continent. Um, you know, and uh, it started a long time ago. I mean, you must give it to the Chinese. Um, I think they set out to um, dominate the world economically and, you know, to be followed suit by military uh, might. And I think to a very large extent, they have been able to succeed at the economic level. They are mm. now the second largest economy, uh, should be overtaking the United States of America in the next few years. Yeah. And uh, it was a deliberate uh, state policy, what they wanted to do. Uh, we must also not forget that about 30, 35 years ago, China was essentially nowhere. But um, as a result of uh, deliberate policies of uh, their political leaders and the elites, they have been able to pull China out of the wood, and China has become a very dominant economic power. Very you know, dominant. Now, nowadays. And um, uh, again, China has also been showing some other kinds of posturing, you know, at uh, the military level. Uh, China has, uh, to a very large extent, been a peaceable country because it has been able to draw from its history of oppression and repression, especially, mm. Mm. I mean, the long centuries of, uh, you know, Chinese uh, existence, they have faced all kinds of turmoil, internal, yeah. you know, external, external. They, especially. They, they've faced the yeah. kind of experience Africa oh, yes. has faced. Oh, yeah, because, you see, in looking at what is going on today, especially with regards to the racism that's going on, it's difficult to imagine China oh, and yes. Chinese people behaving in this manner, this manner. because they have been once you know, subject to the, same uh, the worst form of repression, yes. especially under Japanese occupation exactly. for a very long time. And, uh, uh, but again, you know, part of uh, their policy, especially the, uh, the uh, is it uh, the Belt and uh, Road Initiative? Initiative, yes. Uh, this is, I mean, uh, they're looking at a budget of about one trillion. People have described it as a kind of Marshall Plan investing heavily in developing countries like in you know, our continents like Africa, then you know Latin America and parts of you know disadvantaged Asia. And uh, about it I think what has and if you look at it on the surface, you say it's a very good thing. They are developing infrastructure and the rest. But it is the nature and in the nature and the, the nature and the character of what is actually going on that is causing a lot of concerns. Mm. We get back mm. to the issue of racism. Mm. You know, but the reality is that um, you know, they are bringing in their money, they are developing infrastructure and the rest. And then, I mean, you look at the debt profile, just about in 2006, um, uh, Africa was owing China about, um, about, uh, about uh, $10 billion or so. Within a space of about 10 years or so, yeah. it yeah. had got 2016, it had gotten to around 30 billion. 
So this uh, heavy borrowing Africa that African continues countries to borrow yes, heavily. Have, yes, have continued to do up to now. And now uh, pressure is building, pressure is mounting, because it's becoming very clear that most of these countries are not in a position to pay back. And what worries a lot of people is that China, the terms of the loan, they are tying most of these loans to assets of African countries. Which is and, a very smart move. If yes, you ask. it is a very smart move, but very you know, dangerous for those countries exactly. that are giving up their national assets to China. I mean, people are citing the case of uh, uh, Sri Lanka, where they had to give up their ports. And then um, Zesco in, in, in Zambia is also Zesco, yeah, a, in Zambia, a, you yeah. know, a problem. It's, all, it's also a very serious problem. And then you have parliaments and politicians in most of these countries now beginning to qu ask questions whether these things are not an infringement on the sovereignty of some of these countries that are picking up the loans. Of course, there's a saying in Africa that he who goes a borrowing oh, goes a sovereign. And we're beginning to see some of the impact. But beyond that, again, is that you know, the nature of these loans are so opaque that people have been complaining. They are done under great secrecy. People don't even know the terms of these loans in most cases. Yeah. You know, and then again... And the likes of you as have spoken out uh, loudly yeah. against it, saying yeah. that, look, Africa is being, um, is being uh, systematically um, sold into slavery. I, I know that uh, the former uh, Secretary of State, Til Rex Tillerson, mm. Uh, when he came to Africa, I think he also visited Nigeria, he kept on talking about the danger of uh, Chinese loans and the rest. But of course... Because they don't ask know, questions. Yeah, yeah. But, but of course, people were quick to say that they are not in a position to ask that. Yeah. Because they've also had the opportunities, the opportunities in the exactly. African continent with huge amounts of money being borrowed. I mean, United States, remember the history with uh, Zaire, Mobutu Seseko, exactly. and all, especially during the Cold War. They easily looked the other way while African dictators we are doing all kinds of things yes, and stealing this money yeah, so and then you know ensuring that their countries run into debts that they themselves the united states not totally a saint yeah, yeah they are not uh, europe and the rest and again they have you know they left the space the economic space to china uh, they, they they over time they they began to feel that uh, africa does not have the kind of strategic interest that she used to hold before to the rest of to Europe and the United States. But China also recognized the fact that there are There's still abundant resources, resources, resources in Africa. In Africa. There's so much in Africa. And with their burgeoning economic growth and so on, they needed increasing resources in of oil, mineral, you know, other forms of mineral resources and so on to service China's massive industrial complex. So they need Africa. And that is why they have been doing you know, or giving out all of these loans. But then, like people have said, these loans are not subject to international bidding. Mm. Uh, you want to develop a road infrastructure, you want to build railway, you want to build airports and the rest. These things are done in secrecy, uh, you know. And so, uh, and people have argued that if you were to throw, if they were to throw this, this, this um, uh, infrastructural development uh, by China, if they were to throw it into the open market and have an open bidding, there is going to be significantly less mm. in terms of the cost, eventual cost to some of these African, African countries. countries. So that is also one of the problems, the secrecy behind these loans. And the fact that, again, you know in those days when some of these other countries, especially Europe and America, and through the IMF and the World Bank, wanted to give loans to African countries, they tied these loans down to, I mean, to, to some other things. So, okay. Not, not, not okay. just assets to governance, okay, to gov good know, governance. To political development, yeah. good governance, a free deepening press, of democracy. deepening of democracy, you know, and, and all that human rights. And uh, China is not exactly it's not interested, interested in your, in that. your so domestic issues. In, in the domestic issues. Some people said, yeah, that is OK. But again, it only plays into the hands of dictators and anti-people regimes mm -hmm. in Africa. So we have seen some of these people also do one or two funny things with these monies that China is giving them. It, for th uh, those periods where, that they give money, sometimes they are tied down to infrastructure and all that. So these are some of the issues that have become uh, talking points in the African uh, continent, and it is a source of worry. A source of concern. Yes. All right, um, uh, Chike says it really is a source of concern, uh, uh, Africa-China relations. Is uh, Africa getting uh, you know, the short end of the deal here. These are questions we're asking. Well, we will be having um, a member of the Nigerian Institute of International Affairs, a senior researcher. His name is FM Ubi. He'll be joining us via Skype 
But before he does so, uh, I'd like to bring us uh, this uh, report. Also, actually, driving home what is happening to Africans in China, where African countries are saying, uh, you, you know, students in Africa, in China, beg your pardon, are being really given bad treatment in these times. Let's take this report and uh, we'll be right back. African countries are boiling over accounts that Africans are battling stigma and discrimination in China over the coronavirus pandemic. African residents in the southern city of Guangzhou say they have suffered forced evictions, arbitrary quarantines, and mass coronavirus tests, and face discrimination in restaurants and hotels. Like the management or your landlord call you telling you like after this contract we cannot give you any contract. You have to leave the house. Tell them why. They say no, it's the government who give them like that pressure to, to not let the black people live to their houses. The problem is not the paper, it's the people mind. Because when you go out, before showing the paper, when someone see you, it will run away from you. Recently, the African Union expressed its extreme concern about the situation in Gandao and called on Beijing to take immediate corrective measures. As international pressure mounts, the foreign ministry in Beijing issued a statement saying China attached great importance to the life and health of foreign nationals and rejected all racist and discriminatory remarks. All right, uh, another report there talking about uh, what Nigerian students are facing in China. Studying there, it's not easy, especially when there's stigma. But we have um, joining us via Skype, uh, FM Ubi, um, a senior fellow at the Nigerian Institute of International Affairs. Uh, hello, FM, are you there? I'm here. Thank you, Harry, for having me. Great to, great to see you. I wish you were here, but you know the issue of social distancing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's not easy. Okay, so we can communicate. Uh, we've been talking about recent um, uh, stigma and, uh, you know, unpleasant treatment being meted to Africans in China. And the issue, of, the question it raises about Africa-China relations. Uh, what is your take? You've lived, you've lived in China, and you, you have experienced the, the culture of the people. What is your take on this issue, FM? Well, my take uh, is that um, it's not actually a palatable issue. It's not something we should be happy about. You know, this is a relationship that has been built over the years. You know, uh, for instance, most countries have had almost uh, 50 years uh, relationship with China, some 20 years, some 30 years, and, you know, within a twinkle of uh, uh, an eye, you know, uh, just a blink, you know, everything. Uh, it's about being uh, crumbled, you know, just because of uh, the issue of discrimination. Now, I don't want to call it racism, but I think I, I, think I prefer to call it more of a, a discrimination that's ongoing. And, you know, I, this is something that we've been talking about. I schooled in China. I spent a couple of years in China, and I understand how it is there, you know, and um, I think uh, what the... African what was your experience, FM, and your days in China? Well, I, I didn't quite experience the kind of uh, discrimination ongoing in Guangzhou, you know, where I schooled. I was in the northeast. Uh, northeast is far, far close to Siberia, close to Russia. And so and, uh, it's, it's far away from Guangzhou, uh, Beijing, um, 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 uh, Shanghai. And these places, you know, uh, there's uh, a little bit of more discrimination ongoing there, you know, because there are more Africans, more black people in those areas than where I was. You know, the kind of, my, the kind of uh, experience I had in uh, the Northeast is the fact that a lot of them have not, seen, have not seen black people before. So most times they see us, it's surprising for them, you know. And you know, sometimes you know, the color of the skin, too, is uh, intriguing. They, they, they wonder why uh, human beings will be this dark. But, you know, that for the people in the Northeast who have not seen Africans before, black people before, for them it's strange. You know, they want to come close to you, they want to touch your skin, they want to see if the skin color is coming up and all that. Just were the kind of experience. You know, sometimes we just give in and let them touch us to let them know we are the same human beings like them. We are the same like them. There's no difference. The difference is just in color. 
So, but I didn't really experience the kind of racism that's ongoing or the discrimination that's ongoing in Guangzhou. I can understand the feelings in Guangzhou because there are so many Africans there. You know, I'm surprised, you know, when I was in China and I traveled to Guangzhou, all the Chinese there speak Pidgin English. They will see me, they say, uh, uh, Oga, Oga, you Nigerian or America? Uh, I get what you want, I get what, what you like, what you like. You know, I was surprised and I was wondering how they were speaking Pidgin English. So you can, you, you could realize that, you know, from the, the whole uh, scenario that a lot of Nigerians are also there. You know, but I think the discrimination is not just against Nigeria, but it's against Africans, against black people yeah, everywhere. Against Africans. And it's not a government thing, it's the people's thing. And that is why I have been talking about the relationship, that it should, the government should be more proactive, the two governments, you know, uh, countries in Africa, the governments in Africa, uh, uh, in African countries, and the Chinese government, they should be more proactive. You know, they should build a relationship in such that, such that it will be more of a government relationship than a people-to-people -people relationship. I think the people are driving the relationship too much, and that's where the problem is. Okay, uh, uh, FM. Looking, at, people have raised questions about the the ease of doing business in both countries. Let's take a comparative look. The ease of doing business in Nigeria, we have a lot of Chinese companies, you know, springing up in Nigeria here and there. And yeah, they move around with ease without any difficulty. It's, you know, and I tried to look online and find out, you know, can foreigners really open business in Nigeria? And it's, and, uh, you know, uh, Wikipedia was giving me, you have four options to choose from, a joint venture, representative office, wholly foreign owned enterprise or umbrella company you set up your business as a joint venture. But one thing is uh, reoccurring there is, is that you cannot, it looks as if you cannot single-handedly own a company in China. W what is your take on this? Well, I, I'm going to uh, discuss this based on my research uh, experience in China because in 2015, I went there to do a study on uh, uh, China-Africa trade. Uh, presently, I was looking at uh, china Nigerian trade, but I had to try to understand the, the, the feelings and how it is for Africans who own businesses in China. Yes, a couple of Africans have businesses. But you see, one thing from my experience, from what I have seen, one thing is that for you as an African to run a retail uh, uh, business, you must be married to a Chinese. You know, you find out that a lot of Africans are actually married to Chinese, and the Chinese are the ones running this, the Chinese wives, the Chinese wives, you know, are the ones running this retail business. And I also find out from the uh, Africans who are there that they can't even go to the shop because the visa they have, they can't use that visa to work. So invariably, you can't go to the shop. You just have to stay at home. Your wife will be want to go to the shop and all that. I know it causes a whole lot of problems and makes uh, 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 operating businesses in China very, very, very difficult. Now, my experience is that, you know, if it, by the time I came back to Nigeria when I, after my schooling there, I realized that a lot of Chinese, you see them in the streets, you know, and uh, economically, you know, for a nation that, that is focused on development, the retail business is not for foreigners. Yeah. The retail yeah. business is for the, the for the indigents, the, the right? Citizens, for the and the, and they are competing with us. Yeah. They are competing with you know indigenous Nigerians, um, small scale businesses at the same with the yeah. same you know uh, uh, without any restrictions. Yes, and which is not good for for the economy. Now, in terms of uh, big corporations and all that, you see, you don't, ha you cannot even open a business if a Chinese is not a shareholder. A lot of Chinese must have to have shares in that business for that business to to thrive or, or to to run. But a couple of Africans I know, I've seen that a couple of uh, Europeans and Americans, they all, they have businesses there too, kind of. I know a Nigerian who has a company that has been running for more than ten years in in Shang in Guangzhou and all that in Shanghai branches in Shanghai and Guangzhou and I think he, the business is owned by him and he's married to a Nigerian and so but I think uh, in, in comparative analysis it is easier for them to come here and do whatever they want than you a Nigerian or an African going there to do same thing it's not difficult because for instance uh, one of the experience we had in China we were told you see there are a lot of companies in China there's Mercedes-Benz uh, manufacturing auto auto manufacturing company uh, BMW and the drugs. You see, these companies, when they first moved to China, the Chinese government refused them uh, setting up assembly plants. They told them to come and set up the manufacturing plant. This is the government that knows what it wants. And so, you see, even the Chinese who are coming here, it is high time, you know, in the 21st century, and especially now that uh, we've seen that uh, the post, uh, I mean, the uh, COVID-19, you know, has shown that it is better for countries to be self-reliant and self-sustaining, in quote. 
Anyway, that does not mean I'm negating it. Uh, oh, okay, it FM. FM, hold it there. Let me bring in Chiki. Chiki, you know, we, we've talked about the the um, business environment. We've talked about the, you know, the uh, bilateral relationships. It's time for us to review this, um, you know, based on what we've talked about so far. What are your thoughts on the matter? I mean, it's a desperate uh, situation calls for desperate measures, definitely. And uh, I think uh, Afri Africa finds itself at a crossroads. Uh, we need to review a lot of things, the way we do things in Africa. And it's not just about the leadership and the elites in Africa. Uh, Africans themselves must also determine the kind of life they want to live and the kind of governments and political leaders that should lead them. Obviously, they, we have not made much success uh, in that uh, you know, particular direction. We have long realized the fact that um, it's only Africa that can save Africa and not any foreign uh, you know, um, government Only Africans foreign can save Africa. Because the primary motivation for any, for international engagement, international relationship is primarily interest, national interest. It's never about, you so know, we friendship. So we cannot blame you know? them for that, No, 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 no. They, they are satiating their primary, you know, um, uh, strategic national interests. That is what they are doing. But, you see, we are now seeing the other side of that relationship. And so, for instance, the issue of I mean, China, the discrimination and all of that, because they go hand in hand ultimately at the end of the day. The impression you have is that Africans are very, very accommodating when it comes to non-African, non-Africans themselves. They are more accommodating of foreigners. Is it a more, they are more issue of complex? They, they are, yeah. No, it's not a complex issue. I, I, they are more accommodating, they are more hospitable, they are more respectful, you know, and they are more protective of foreigners. I mean, even even it's, it's a cultural, even, even, it's, it's a, it cultural. is a cultural. Even here in Nigeria, we tend to show more sympathy to the foreigner than even a fellow Nigerian in most cases, uh, you know. And we have, we see that also with regards to the Chinese treatment of Chinese. But obviously, that that uh, relationship is not being reciprocated, just like what is happening the discrimination and the racism in China. Uh, but again, it is not just the people. It's not about the people. It's uh, it's a structural thing. It's a state thing. The state is involved in it because if you look at the nature of Chinese government, Chinese regime over the years, it is a police state. China is a police state. Okay. China is a closed state. There's nothing that goes on in any part of China as, as big as China is that is not a, you know, known to local government authorities and then from there, if it is a serious thing, to the central government in China. So these acts of you know, discrimination and racism, these attacks on African, a structural issue. They are known to the government. Obviously, issues. the government has not done much about it. In the report, you know, that very fine report, you know, preceding uh, this discussion or this conversation, it talked about, I think, the, the submission, you know, of, of that report the was that African, yeah, that. But the African countries find themselves in a difficult situation, you know, to do anything about it because we are heavily indebted to China and their consequences. But it's not a government to government thing. I know what uh, my friend here is, is saying. Yes, he's talking about, you know, uh, maybe at that level trying to resolve it, but it is beyond because it is becoming a people to people thing. Okay. You know, it's about the Chinese people and the African people. Then the governments of these con con countries, especially the Chinese government, is not doing enough hmm. to lean on their people to ensure that their people behave. In, in a way that they are, that in China, that they are good hosts to Africans who are in their country, and that in the continent, that they are good guests, you know, to, the, to Africans who are their hosts. Because we see this kind of outrageous behavior in China, in the homeland, and also even here in Africa. You know what I mean? There is a video online, circulated online, where a young boy, uh, you know, uh, Chinese, was calling the, the, the Kenyan uh, Africans monkeys and how, I mean, much he hates them. A Chinese and, and national came, in Kenya was oh, yes. flogging oh, and uh, was, oh, was his flogging his Yeah, there's one again where he flogged the staff. And then the man that was, you know, saying all the, I mean, these things about uh, calling Africans monkeys in their own country, their own continent, also said the Uhuru Kenyatta, the president of Kenya, is also, I mean, also described him in such a denigrating manner. Now that is the height of insolence. And this thing has been going on for quite some time. And the Chinese government and Chinese authorities are quite aware. And that was why, I mean, that wonderful uh, video that, that, that was circulating on, online where a low cadre, you know, diplomat did perhaps what yeah. the, Chinese, the Nigerian uh, many foreign minister the, cannot do, not do yes. and what high-ranking government officials cannot do. Interrogated he called, them, yeah. interrogated them and, and called them out and showed the anger, and that is the anger of a state. 
And he said something about the Nigerian passport, that this passport, that if you disrespect you know, a man carrying mm -hmm. the Nigerian passport, passport. that you are, you are disrespecting the entirety of the Nigerian country and the president of, of, of the country. And, and I mean, and that was fantastic. I've not seen a Nigerian in a very long time stand up that for his country. A, that was an you, interesting you, 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 phenomenon. It, it yeah. was, you know. So these are some of, so the, but the reality is that look, Regardless of the depth profile, I mean, uh, we, we have with regards to China. Regardless, they are going to China, America, the Chinese. America the Chinese is government, the debt, the debt to, exactly, to, to China as exactly. Well. The Chinese government is going to lose because what you are going to see is you're going to see, you know, a handshake across the continent of Africa, across the the the, the, the subregions of I mean of of Africa. You're going to see solidarity among African countries. Okay. And once it becomes something that is grassrooted, that's a people thing, it becomes a nightmare situation for African governments who must have to act in tandem with the will of their people. people. And so that puts pressure on the Chinese people to rein in you know, this, what I'll call this madness. All right. You know, by their people. Rain the madness, uh, Chiki says. Uh, FM, are you there? If you're listening to the discussion, uh, uh, what, you, you've heard what Chiki has said so far. Uh, do, yes. do, you, do, you, um, do you agree with what he's saying? And what do you think can be done to curb this going forward? Uh, first, I disagree with some few, uh, few of his analysis, you know, a bit of it, you know. Uh, first, I, I, I would like to address the issue of where he said a junior, a junior diplomat uh, stood up to the Chinese uh, authorities, something that the minister or uh, an ambassador cannot do. I yeah. don't think so. No. You know, yeah. so, at that time, that thing happened. He was the person there because he's a consul, a Nigerian consul in Guangzhou. So he's supposed to handle that. You cannot expect the ambassador to come from Beijing to handle an issue like that. In Shanghai, you mm. know, it, yeah, we have consuls there and all that. So I think... Uh, that is not really the case. You know, that's not how diplomacy works. Then secondly, he talked about the fact that discrimination is stated. Uh, but, but I think I have to correct that too. I school in China, the first thing, when I got into China, they gave me some rules in my school. And one of the rules there was that race uh, discrimination based on race, ethnic, is, it's, it's illegal in China. And I realized that by, for the number of years I stayed there, most Africans, once you know, there's a problem, you know, with them and the Chinese. The first thing they do is to uh, beckon on that rule that they say that this is racism. This is what they... And so the Chinese will give up because it's actually a crime in China. And the next thing he said is the fact that it's a, it's a, it's a government thing. You know, uh, the, the government has not asked the Chinese to do that. You see, the Chinese people themselves are doing it. And my initially, what I said, and what I said about that the relationship is a people-to-people -people relationship is not... I mean, the people play more prominent role in the China-African relationship than the government. You see, if the two governments were really talking and they are proactive and they, and they are listening to a whole lot of issues, there are a lot of issues beyond that discrimination that I have talked about. You know, Henry, we've talked about that. For instance, the visa problem. You know, visa, uh, 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 visa, giving up uh, 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 the Chinese visa to Nigerians. You know, the terms of reference is different from how it is with other countries. I think there's a problem. I think part of the problem is our government, and part of the problem is the Chinese government. Mm. And that is why the two governments need to sit at the Forum of China-Africa Cooperation. That should be the platform for which they should sit down. Like Chike said, I think it is high time the Africans begin to realize what they want, what they need, how to go about it. I've told you before now in most of the programs I've attended in your station that there is no policy of engagement. No African country has a policy of engagement with any advanced country. Have you ever seen a Nigerian German uh, 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 policy of engagement or white paper policy? But there's a China African white paper policy. There's a US African white policy paper. There's a, uh, a UK African policy. There is a, and there's an EU African policy. Have you ever seen a Kenyan US Af uh, policy? No. You see, this is why this is this is why we are being on the mind, mm. and that is why development is actually very difficult because okay. we are not we are, we are we are not strategizing for the future, and this is the time. At least COVID nineteen has shown that we are not sustainable. Okay. In short, as, as a matter of fact, you know, my, you've seen some of my articles. I've said it. Africa, Nigeria is on the brinks. Anything can disintegrate Nigeria. Anything can collapse Nigeria. Down, uh, Michael Dolden wrote in his work that Nigeria is the first state that works. And I just read another article where the person said that Nigeria is a big economy, not because Nigeria has got everything, but because Nigeria is surviving without the provision of, or without the social provisioning of government. 
that the, if the same thing happened in the West, those countries will collapse. For instance, there's no light, there's no water, there is no uh, good roads and all that, but that you are still survive. You provide light for yourself, you provide water for yourself. I think it is time. You see, the whole idea of death, you know, and I, I don't think it's because the Africans are owing enough, uh, too much uh, 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 money to the Chinese. It is, you see, the, 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 the argument about the death trap, you know, we talked about that. Okay. You see, it's, not, it's, it's, it's imaginary. It's, it's, it's an abstraction. And now, I have written several times, China forgave a lot of countries debt because they could not pay. For instance, uh, Botswana was forgiven $7 billion at the last forecast meeting. Zimbabwe, too, was they, 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 cut, they, they, they took away the interest. They shouldn't pay interest over the debt. They, they were more than the $15 billion and all that. I think it is high time. It's not about the debt. Again, I want to address the issue that, uh, you know, when you, you, you talk, you said it was complex that makes uh, the Chinese, you know, uh, the, uh, the Africans, and it's, uh, it's, uh, then uh, Chike said it's a cultural thing. It is not a cultural thing. I, I, stand to, I stand to disagree with Chike. He, it's not a cultural. He, yes, we are hungry. We are hospitable. But he, that does not mean we should be foolish. It's not culture. Okay, he cannot, he's, you, yeah, Chike, he's, def, he's, he's um, um, actually, he doesn't agree with your position as... as a reaction to Nigerians to Chinese as being cultural. He says, look, it's, no, it's, it's no, more folly. He, yeah. As, no, he said, he said it's because we are hospitable, it's a culture, we allow them to come and do anything and they go scot free. No, it's because we don't have standardized rules. Okay, we don't have standardized it's rules. Said, no, there should be a policy of, an economic policy okay. of investment, you know, uh, uh, of, uh, 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 of either contractual investment or for trade or for whatever reasons for what if you want to set up a business all right because here everything goes everything goes all right Why a chinese, can, go, a chinese oh. can stand at the street of lagos and be selling knives kitchen knives you no know, it doesn't work that way it is not we are now we are not hospitable we should have rules okay all right like every family has every family every home has rules uh, I, sure. I do get your perspective there but let's get some reactions now uh Ganzel, um, speaking to the press, China's ambassador to Nigeria uh, has recorded, he says, uh, Guanza has recorded 110 imported cases of COVID-19, and this includes 19 infected Africans. Could be the, this be the reason for that reaction? Re actually, not um, enough reason. But let's get this, and we'll be right back. We are on top of the situation. I have to um, express our profound gratitude to the ambassador of China here in Nigeria. He acted immediately and reached uh, the most important uh, elements in the Chinese government hierarchy. Uh, the reaction of the government has been very, very quick. And, um, and, and so they're now working together as a team. It's unfortunate that the, 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 the government in Guangdong uh, did not reach out early enough to our authorities, uh, consulate uh, in uh, Guangdong and uh, Shanghai and Beijing. But now that communication has been established and they're now working together as a team, communicating and letting everybody know that these measures are to assure the safety of the Nigerians, as well as everybody in China, and in particular in uh, Guangdong uh, province. For us, it's a super clear. All foreign nationals are treated equally in China. We object, we reject any differential practices. We have zero tolerance for discrimination. That is uh, 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 the situation about Guangzhou. And uh, finally, I should say, the Chinese are a grateful nation. We will never stand by and leave our friends in difficulty. We say it, and we will do it. All right, uh, a Chinese ambassador to Nigeria there, Jiao Ping Jani, saying no, China would never mal maltreat you know, any foreign national. But the videos tell the story. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the videos don't lie. 
Um, these are not just allegations. Achike, you want to follow up on what uh, FM was saying before we took yeah, that? Well, you know. well, well um, uh, what I was just trying to say uh, is, we're, but yeah, we're wrapping know, up know, anyway. What, what I was trying to say is that we should not absolve the Chinese government of responsibility. Mm. They have a duty. Mm. They have an international obligation to protect foreigners even within their territories. Okay. You understand? And they also have a duty to ensure that even when Chinese are in other countries that they behave themselves in ways that are con in consonance with the laws of, 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 the, of the country. So if their citizens are misbehaving, the government also has a role to play to call them you to You think order. it's time for us yes. to reevaluate, you no, know, some rules no, 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 and, you we know, must, issues I agree with business FM. FM, FM made some fundamental, you know, contributions, uh, statements, and that is the truth. The reality is that we do not have, you know, a comprehensive, you know, uh, method of engagement yeah. with some of these foreign countries. And he talked about, you know, what kind of policy, what's the level of engagement that we should have. And that will determine whatever we do at the level of business, at the level of politics, at, at so many other levels. That is the way these things are done. Mm. Uh, you know, these things are defined, they are clear. So that even if one government, one government leaves the Rules state, of another, another, yeah. another government comes in place, you know, he has to work in consonance with, you know, this rule, you know, rules of policies that have been developed, you know, on behalf of the country, you know, by the previous government. So this is, is, is it. And then, but he also said something about, you know, the retail business, and he made that point, really. Any serious company, and that tells you how far the country has fallen, that the Chinese would come into the country, I mean, and they, and, 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 and they are competing with shoemakers, they are competing with carpenters, they are competing, they are even sweeping streets and factories, they are factory hands and the rest. So what do you, exactly do you have left for the people? There's a Ministry of Labor, there is, you know, a Nigerian Labor Congress and all of that. All of these things are, 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 can, are not in, you know, in consonance with the spirit mm. of even, you know, international relationship and with the, the existing labor laws in the country. And you would expect that something has to be done to protect the ordinary people, the poor and the vulnerable. This, the government has not been able to do. To and do. and uh, I think it's a crying shame. It's critical. All right, critical, he says. And yes, FM, time for me to bring you in and so you can say your goodbye. But really, before you go, please, what is your final take on this matter? Uh, how do we get ourselves? You've talked about us having a, pr a, pr a strategy, a policy in place as a, that will determine and will um, dictate how we deal with every other country, not China. But finally, what do you, what do you say? Yeah, I think Chike has said a lot in, in terms of uh, uh, his conclusion. You know, I, 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 will, I, will, I will take us back to the former administration of uh, President Goodluck Jonathan. You know, the, the, his uh, seven-point agenda. The beginning of that document stated categorically that the problem with Nigeria is the three Cs. Three Cs, which is consistency, continuity, and commitment. You see, this is what every nation should have. And like Kike said, government is in continuity. So if one leaves, that one continues. So there should be stated policies. You know, and uh, uh, lay down rules that will, you know, as you come, you build on the other one. As you come, you see, it's only, it's only in this country I see a contractor, a contract will be awarded, and the next, even within the same party, the next governor will come and will throw away that contract and start another new thing. You know, we waste so much money. I think it is time that we need to be, to be development, the development focus. We need to start thinking about development. Our focus now shouldn't just be uh, security. Corruption. It should also right. be governance and good leadership. I think we have to take that in good consideration. If not, the future is actually very bleak. All As right. I'm talking to you. If you have written, if you, if you wrote, if you I mean, if you read my paper, my okay. fear for Africa uh, and its future amidst COVID-19, you understand what I mean that the future is bleak because we don't do anything. We don't manufacture anything. All we right. Don't the have future. To governance and all that. So I think we need to sit up. And all right, we up. will sit up and I believe the future is bright. As long as we are here, as long as you and I are here, we remain as astute that things cannot fall apart. And so there is hope and there is light at the end of the tunnel. Thank you, gentlemen. I want to thank um, FM, um, senior researcher at the Nigerian Institute of International Affairs. Thank you for joining us on the agenda. Thank you, William. All right, and uh, that does it. Uh, um, Chike, thank you very much for coming on the show. Always a pleasure. Uh, certainly look forward to seeing you, and we hope this lockdown will be over soon. Uh, can, we can interact as we yeah. normally do.
Uh, well, that has been the show on today's edition. Uh, remember that only Africans can build Africa. Only Africans can build Africa. It's our responsibility to wake up this sleeping giant. My name remains Henry Williams, and thank you for joining me. I leave you with some sound bites. The former minister of Nigeria, name is uh, Obi Ezekwesili, Dr. Obi Ezekwesili. She talks about the failure of leadership and policy inconsistency as one of the beans of Africa. We'll leave you with that thought, and we'll see you same time, same station. God bless you. We are talking about a pool of people. You said 12 million do enter the labor market every year. I need you to know that only 10% of the 12 million would find anything that is defined as decent jobs, according to ILO. Now, if only 10% would find those jobs, and we've got this 90% that are on the margins of society, that is the issue of governance for us. We must look at the, the failure of governance to actually in, in, have the right kinds of policies that lead to growth. The growth that is diversified, the growth that is inclusive. And at the heart of this is what kind of education system, what kind of skills are we emphasizing, what kind of economic opportunities. Issue on the African scene, the politics of succession in Africa, the crisis of stability and power. How, how critical is this? Police arrested for the violence, the violence, while eight others were arrested.